Hi, my name is Chris, and I have the privilege of serving as the worship pastor here at the Life Church. Here at TLC, we exist to impact culture through the innovative presentation of Christianity through inspiring people to live a better life. And we are so excited that you have decided to watch from wherever you are tuning in from. If you haven't already, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. We believe that God has a word just for you. So get your notes ready and let's jump into today's incredible message. So let's go to the book of John chapter 5. The book of John chapter 5. of John chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 1 through 15. Here's what it says in the Amplified Version. Later on, there was a Jewish feast, a festival, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, there is a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Jewish, and Aramaic, Bethesda, having five porticos. In these porticos lay a great number of people who were sick, blind, lame, withered, waiting, for the stirring of the water. For an angel of the Lord went down into the pool at appointed seasons and stirred up the water. The first one to go in after the water was stirred was healed of their disease. There was a certain man there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus noticed him lying there helpless, knowing that he had been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to get well the invalid answered sir I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up and while I am coming to get into it myself someone else steps down ahead of me Jesus said to him get up pick up your pallet and walk and immediately the man was healed and recovered his strength and immediately the man was healed and recovered his strength and immediately the man I just wish somebody would get a faith in their life today they said it can happen today I'm just looking for 12 it don't got to be everybody they say that it don't got to happen next week something can happen for me today and picked up his pallet and walked now that day was the Sabbath five more verses real quick so the Jews kept saying to the man who have been healed. It is a Sabbath and you are not permitted to pick up your pallet because it is unlawful. And he answered them, the man who healed me gave me back my strength. He was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. He, he gave me an instruction that was different than your instructions. And they asked him, who is this man who told you? Pick up your pallet and walk. I love this part. Now the man who had been healed didn't even know who it was. It's crazy. Like, you know you can change people's lives and not take credit for it. Okay, 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 okay. So, 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 he didn't know who it was. For Jesus had slipped away unnoticed since there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you're well. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. So, the man went away, told the Jews it was Jesus who had made him. Well, I want to preach from this thought today. If you're a note taker, pray that you are. Our sermon title is Get Well Soon. Get Well Soon. God, I pray that they not hear my voice or see my face, but only hear and see the voice and face of you that lives in me. I decrease as you increase. And I'm asking you to have your way. Open our ears and open our hearts that we may live and look more like you at the end of our time together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said together, amen. Get well soon. I don't know about you guys, but um, I, 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 I've told my story many times. I am very familiar uh, with the medical industry and the medical world. I have uh, gone to hospitals so much that I got favorite doctors and nurses. Come on here. I, I go in and I check on people's kids. I'd be like, how you doing? How did the game go? Y'all good? And so, um, so I have a, a, a relationship with many people who are in the medical industry. And, and, and you know, and that's just been because of my history. And, and here's what's so interesting. It's a love-hate relationship. Because, you know, when you see somebody who's in the medical industry, you really don't want to be going there. I mean, like, you, you don't want to have to go to the doctor. You need to go to the doctor. And... 
And so it's a love-hate relationship, but, but, but we've navigated it well. And, and, and I love all my nurses and, and, and all my oncologists and, and all of the people who do radiology and all of that. But, but there's one set of medical professionals, y'all, that test my faith, that test my spirituality like no other. Now, I know I'm just preaching about me today. I know I'm not preaching about y'all. I'm just preaching about me. But, but, but if you ever want to see your spiritual life be tested, go to physical therapy. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying, I, know, I love my physical therapist. I love my physical therapist. I, I love my physical therapist. I'm just saying, if you've ever been to physical therapy, anybody ever been to physical therapy? It, 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 is, it, is, a, uh, it is a nuanced experience because watch this, you're getting well while feeling bad. If you want to see a tear come out the corner of a strong man's eye, take him to physical therapy. <laughs> Physical therapy push you, it, it sets you. And, and, and in my experience, and in many who've been through therapy's experience, physical therapy, you'll find this. You tend to reach a point where you are proud of what you can do now. Yeah. I, I was at the gym the other day, and somebody who knew I had had surgery last year asked me, how are you doing? You look well. And I said, yeah, man, it's great. I, I, I used to couldn't get on the stationary bike. Now I can. I, I used to couldn't get on rides at the, so the theme park with my kids. Now I can. I, I used to couldn't do this, and I used to couldn't do that. I love where I'm at now. But here's what I've come to find as you go through any medical journey, that many of us measure our health by our preferences but they measure our health by our possibilities. That, that, that we can sometimes be walking with somebody and say, man, look at what I can do now. This is my preference. As long as I can do this, I'm good. And yet while we measure our health by our preferences, they measure our health by our possibilities. They say, I, I, I love what you can do, but let me tell you what you could do. I, I, I love how far you've come, but let me tell you how far you could go. I, I love that you can stand up, but I, I'm telling you now, I'm going to show you how you can walk. I love that you're walking, but let me tell you, if you keep going, you maybe can run. I, I love that you're running, but can I tell you something? That it could be jumping in your future. That there is more than your preference, but there are some possibilities. And as you grow in this life with Christ, here's what I've come to find. You may find that there are moments when you get satisfied with how far you come. You may find that there are places in your spiritual journey where you become satisfied with how far you've grown, but stuck in how far you could go. Paul addresses this in the scripture. He, he, he's talking to a body of believers who've been walking with God for a period of time. And he even says to them, I expected you all to be further along by now. He's not saying they're a disappointment because they haven't gone anywhere. He's saying, why are you still on milk when you should be on Solid food. Why are you still satisfied that you just read your Bible once a week when you have been doing that for the last 10 years, y'all quiet? Why are you satisfied with the fact that you come to church but you still don't got power? Why are you satisfied with just being good enough when there is more? That I want you well. And it is very possible, watch it, you can be saved and still unwell. You can be strong and unwell. Come on, if some of us be honest, we are the strong one in our friendship circle. We are the strong one in our family. We are the strong one at our job. We are the strong one in that environment. And everybody sees us as the strong one. But it is very possible to be strong and still unwell. Make somebody mad on this one. You can be gifted and unwell. And here's the danger. It's easier to see a sick body, but you can hide a sick soul. You, 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 you can look good on the outside and be falling apart on the inside. 
You can smile well on Sunday and still be full of tears on Tuesday. That you can be doing a lot of stuff for God and still need God to show up and make something different in your life. I just came to preach to 50 real people for the next 30 seconds. They say, I went through some seasons where I was strong and still unwell. I was gifted and still unwell. I was used, but still unwell. I was praying and still unwell. I was singing and still unwell. I was showing up for other people, but I am unwell. And Jesus shows up to a man who has been unwell for 38 years. Which suggests to us that his faith has likely been weathered in the storm of waiting. You you ever waited so long on God that you knew how to say faith stuff? Nobody's going to be real over here. I'm going to just talk to y'all today. Have you ever been in a season where you knew the right thing to say, but what you were saying didn't match how you really feel? Come on, churchy people. Come on, churchy people. Don't play with me today. You'll be like, "Mm, I know he's a healer. Yeah, but I'm tired of him not healing. He's a way maker, but when you at home on Wednesday, you're like, when you going to make a way? 38 years. I've been coming here. Coming to the place where you said change happens. Coming to the place where I've seen other people get a miracle. Coming to the place where other people seem to get free. Coming to the place where it seems like other people get delivered. Coming to the place where it seems like somebody always gets it ahead of me. Coming to a place where the preacher keeps saying, if it happened for them, it's on your road. And yet it seems like it hasn't hit my house. I'm here. But something in me is unwell. And to that man, Jesus says, hey, I see you here at the portico. What's going on, man? You good? How's your day going? Good day? Good day. Okay. Ah, uh, see you around the lane, people here. See you waiting for the water to be stirred. Hey, got a question for you. He's like, oh, sure, what's up? Do you, do you, do you want to be well? Now, I know y'all real safe. Can we, just, can we just take two steps back real quick? Like, can I be honest with y'all? Can we be family today? Like, we all first cousins today? Now, you know, seriously, don't judge me after this. We all first cousins today? Can I tell you, like, I love God. Uh, 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 and, and I feel like I've grown to a level of spiritual maturity in my life. I hope so because, you know, God is good. But, but here's the deal. There are some things that bother me still in life. I know I'm, just, I'm not talking about you. I'm just talking about me. You can pray for me. Like, here are a few things that bother me. Uh, uh, one of the things that bothers me is having the same conversation over and over again. Like people who want to call you back to vent about the same thing you already gave them advice about. Like I don't do well with people who don't store wisdom. It bothers me. Uh, you know another thing bothers me? People who don't read the room well. Come on, everybody got one friend. Come on, stop playing. You know, you'd be like, read the room. Here's the third one. Here's the third one. I'm, I'm going to get off of it when it's good. You know one of the things that bothers me? Um, one of the things that bothers me, uh, I, we first cousins, right? I can say this how I feel it, right? Okay, 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 okay. One of the things that bothers me is dumb questions. Now, I know y'all can't say this, okay? So I'm going to say it for you. Like when you had a whole meeting and you sent out meeting notes and you sent the email and then somebody comes and asks the question that you already gave answers to. I'm just preaching to a few of y'all, not everybody. And then you got to respond in a professional, mad way per my email. (laughs) Per last meeting. (laughs) I know you heard me say this before. So I know y'all love Jesus. But if we can all just be human for a moment. The man has been ill for 38 years. The man is in a place. If I'm in an emergency room, don't come up to me and ask me, hey, how you doing? So happy you're here tonight. The app doesn't come on to nine, but between now and then, do you want to be well? 
Because clearly, that's what I'm here for. Watch this, watch this. And here's what I've come to find. Jesus never asked us questions for his own benefit. He asked so that we can get in the business of knowing how to think, not just how to receive. Watch this. Because it is very easy for us to build a theology of faith that knows how to receive from God, but not how to still think about God in the right way. And in this tension, something is revealed about him. Look at what happens. He responds to Jesus by saying, I, I, I would, but, somebody say but. You don't understand. Like, nobody's here to help me. Like, they help other people, and people move ahead of me, and people, and you don't understand that they knew them, and they had a network, and they grew up in that neighborhood. And he begins telling Jesus all the reasons why he can't be. Well, here's why. Because blame is the easiest way to breed a lack of wellness. Can I prove it to you in Scripture? I don't want you to think it's just me. Look at what it says, verse 7. He says, I have no one to put me in the pool. And when the water is stirred, while I'm coming to get myself here, someone steps in ahead of me. Somebody say, blame. blame. Okay. But it doesn't start here in the New Testament. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Really quick, a few verses. Genesis chapter 3. But the Lord God called the man. This is right after Adam and Eve have eaten from the fruit from the forbidden tree. What happens? Look at what it says. It says, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid, so... Was naked, so I hid. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman. Hey, it was her. She gave me that fruit and I ate it. Verse 13. Then he said, okay, let me talk. So Eve, Eve, what happened? She said, the serpent. Everybody ate the fruit, but it was their fault, and it was his fault, and it was her fault. Book of Exodus, let's see it, let's see it. Look at book of Exodus, chapter 32, verse 21 through 24. They've just come out of captivity. They are in the wilderness for the first time. They're waiting on Moses to come off of the mountain. Look at what happens. It says, finally, he turned to Aaron and demanded, why did these people do to you and make you do such terrible sin upon them? Now, here's what's happened in the time when Moses had went away to meet with God, the people were tired of waiting. And so while being tired of waiting, they go to Aaron, the second in command, and they're like, hey, um, hey, do us a favor. Make us something to worship. Make us an idol. And so they all bring together their jewelry. They forge a golden calf. They create this idol for them to worship. And then Moses comes down and is like, what in the world are y'all doing? This is upset God. So verse 22, he says to him, this is what Aaron says back to him, don't get so upset. You yourself know how these people, hey, dog, you know how these people get. These people did it. These people, I love what it says. It says, they said to me, make us God, who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So I told them, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. And when they brought it to me, I simply, I love the language. I, look, all I did was throw it in the fire. It ain't like I bought it. I didn't go get it. I didn't, I just threw it in the fire and look what happened. Somebody say blame. Blame, 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 blame. Last one, last one. I just want you to see the theme. 1 Samuel 15, 19 through 21. Look at what it says. Uh, Samuel has been given an instruction to completely destroy the Amicalites, but, but, but he decides to keep some of the stuff he preferred. Some of the stuff he liked. It says, why did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but instead swooped down on with the shouts of victory and did evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I've gone on in the mission on which he sent me. And I, he said, I did all these things. Look at verse 21. But the people, th th these troops that you gave me, they bought me in this stuff. It, it, I didn't go get it. They bought it. And here's what I came to let you know today. The enemy is banking on you building your life on blame. Because blame is a belief killer. Hear me. It gives power to people that can always be superseded by God. 
And I need a few of us to make up in our mind today that we are tired of pointing the finger. And we're making up in our lives, our life will point to God when we say, I'm no longer going to blame it on what they did. I'm no longer going to blame it on what they said. I'm no longer going to blame it on what they felt. I'm no longer going to blame it on their opinion. But I'm going to make up in my mind everything about my life will point to God. And I'm not going to use them as an excuse for my lack of obedience. I'm not going to use them as an excuse for my lack of love. I'm not going to use them as an excuse for me building walls and shutting people out. I'm going to make up in my mind that my life will not be be built on blame, but we be built on the power of God. Jesus is asking the question of us that he asked of them, do you want to be well? I, I know there's others that go ahead of you, but do you want to be well? I know that there's some others who had a head start that you didn't have, but that's not what I'm asking you right now. What I'm asking you is, do you Do you want to be? Well, because some of us, be honest, we've enjoyed the attention that comes from being the victim. We've enjoyed the attention that has come from being the one that always needs rescuing. Some of us are worried that if we didn't need to be rescued, nobody would call. Some of us are worried that that, that if we weren't like, like, like we built such an identity around our need, that will people still love me the same? Will people still call me? Will people still show up? Will people still see me? What happens when, when I don't need them the way I used to? And God says, okay, you needed them to get well, but now I'm moving you into a new life group. No, 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 you, you, you needed that person so that you could get stronger. You weren't called to marry them, they were just called to help you get out of the mess. What, what happens when Jesus looks at our lives and says, I want more for you. Do you want to be well? But don't miss this, all right, I gotta say this, and I'm gonna give you three quick points, you ready? But wellness takes work. Wellness takes work. If anybody knows Ashley, um, my wife, she is an expert at being very organized, very planned. Uh, she has a strategy um, uh, for everything. Uh, if you come to our house, all the meals for the week are outlined on the back of the pantry door. The snacks are properly proportioned. If you get two bags instead of one, you have messed up the ratio for the week. Uh, but she has a calendar that lets us know what we're eating. The other day, I was like, hey, babe, I'm feeling spaghetti. I think I'm going to make spaghetti. She was like, no, spaghetti's for Wednesday. I said, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> and yet, some of y'all was like, I don't see the problem. I don't. Sounds like being prepared for life to me, Vernon. <laughs> but one of the things that every now and then she'll just like spontaneously do something. Like some of y'all remember uh, when she shared that she just will get this urge and she went and took swim lessons like a year ago. Like she just went and did swim lessons. So not too long ago, uh, this interesting thing happened. Um, uh, it was like uh, last week, actually. Um, I was like... I was like, hey, babe, you know, we're doing this workout. We should just stay healthy. She was like, oh, yeah, cool. I actually started something already. I started 75 soft. I said, What? She said, yeah, I'm 10 days in. I said, okay, several things wrong with this. First of all, how are you going to start a whole workout routine and not talk to your husband about it? So, you know, she says, um, yeah, I'm doing 75 soft. Now, I was alarmed because I said, no, you got it wrong, baby, 75 hard. Like, no, I know what I'm talking about. It's 75 hard. She was like, no, I'm doing 75 soft. I was like, babe, it's not called 75 soft. It's called 75 hard. She said, no, there is now a 75 medium and a 75 soft. I was like, see, this is our problem in culture. We don't ever want to do the hard thing. We just, we just make up reasons to compromise doing it. And so we agreed as a family we were going to do it together throughout our sabbatical. We did it together. The whole kids got involved. Family got involved. Everybody was doing the workout. And the challenge with 75, if you don't know what I'm talking about, is that it means you have to work out every single day. You have to find space in your schedule to do something every single day. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? I got a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old. There is nothing that is easy about doing something 
every single day. We travel and we go to ministry events. We just got back from Columbia, South Carolina. And yet we have to do this every single day. Why? Because a change in results almost always requires a change in routine. And a lot of us are going to leave here to say, I want to be well. And I'm here to tell you that you cannot be well without changing some of your ways. Woo. Wellness is going to show up in how much more time you make for God. Wellness is going to show up in how much more time you stop watching TV. Wellness is going to show up in how you change your routine. Wellness is going to show up in how you change your eating habit. Wellness is going to show up in how you change in your spending habit. There has to be a change in your routine if you want to see a change in your results. And so... Today, I think this man shows us three things that if we want to be made well, we have to do. Three things really quick. Are you ready? Here's number one. You have to recognize your limits. You have to recognize your limits. I love what happened. Jesus sees this man. Have a conversation. The man has positioned himself as close as possible for a miracle. Ralph, he's done all that he can do to get close to the miracle. I admire that about the man. He has done everything possible to put himself in a position to experience a change in his life. He, 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 he has gotten as close as he can take himself. And then the healer shows up. Jehovah Rapha. And when he begins a conversation with this man, I love this. His spirituality doesn't show up. I'll make somebody mad on this one. Yeah. But his humanity shows up. See, if some of us be honest, we've done church so long that when the healer shows up, we act like we're well. So an altar call happens, they'll be like, if anybody just needs, like, you know, your heart is hurting or, you know, you're having a rough time or, or you need to repent from something. And we're like, there's no way I can go up there because people know that I'm, 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 a, I'm a church leader. I grew up apostolic. Certainly I don't, I don't need to go to the altar. Certainly, I don't need hands laid on me. Certainly, I don't need anybody interceding for my marriage. Certainly, I don't need anybody interceding for my mind. Certainly, I don't need support for my mental health. Certainly, I have to be fine. A lot of us come to church every Sunday, and the healer's here, and we act well. Some of us, our prayer lives are consumed with, I'm well. But this man, humanity shows up. And what I love is his humanity does not disqualify him from his healing. Here's what I've come to find. Because most miracles start with self-awareness. It's really important. Most miracles in scripture are not the result of heaven's interruption, but humanity's invitation. What if the Lord is waiting on your humanity for him to actually change your situation? Blind Bartimaeus, Lord, help me. Woman with the issue of blood. I can sit here and stay in my stuff. Or I can expose myself and get healed. Jay Iris' daughter, I'm a religious leader. I'm not supposed to be the one. I teach. I know the word. I, I've been with God. I'm not the one who's supposed to be running after Jesus. But my daughter is unwell. And I'm tired of being this way. I need help. And I wonder today, how many of us just need to recognize our limits? In the book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, if you've never read this book before by Pete Scazzaro, it has been one of the most transforming books of my life. Easily one of the top five best reads I have ever read. 
emotionally healthy spirituality. Pete Cazero says this, ignoring our emotions is turning our back on reality. Listening to our emotions ushers us into reality. Watch this. And reality is where we meet God. It is okay for you to recognize I've reached my limits. I, I, for some of you, that's all you needed to hear today. You've done all you could do. Now let the healer show up and take it from here. Recognize your limits. Here's the second thing. Watch this. You have to respond to new instruction. I love what happens when he acknowledges his limits. He says, hey, I'm trying, man. I did everything I could. I came as far as I could go. And now these people, they keep going ahead of me. They got help. They got support I don't have. I really do want to be better. I just can't be better. And he says, okay, cool, cool, cool. And Jesus says this. All right, cool. Here's what we're going to do. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Take up your mat and walk. Now, in this moment, he has every reason to be like, huh? It's been 38 years. You just showed up here. I don't even know who you are. Get up. Take up your mat. Walk. And it's in this tension that many of us find ourselves that we'll go to prayer. And I want to help somebody because when you take this word and you start going to your prayer closet, God might ask you to do something that seems strange. You're going to have to make up in your mind. You can make excuses or you can make a move, but you can't do both. You can make excuses or you can make a move, but you can't do both. And the man is laying there and he's like, I've sat here day after day and I've watched people get a miracle. I don't know this person. Praying is new to me. This is a unique experience. I, I've, never, I've never felt the Lord speak to me before. I feel prompted to do something strange, to call somebody, to ask for help from this person, to go to that church and join a life group, to get in a growth track class. So I, can, I don't know why God is prompting me to do this. But it's a simple question. Do I want to stay here? Do I want to be well? And I believe he made up in his mind, I just... If I just do the first thing he said, what did he say? He said, get up. But God, I, what if I look stupid? But God, what if, I, what if I fall in front of people? I mean, 38 years, what if, what if, what if his legs were atrophied? And he, he was like, what if, what if they laugh at me? Jesus, Jesus said, get up. So, okay. And the Bible says, immediately, he was strengthened. Now, here's what I believe. I believe that the scripture is very consistent about this, that very often healing happens while people are, are moving with God. So the lepers were healed as they walked. I believe as he began to get up, strength began. As he decided to say, I'm going to join a group. I'm going, I don't, I don't know all the right songs and I don't know no hymns. And I ain't grown up in church. Or I have grown up in church, but I've been so busy acting strong that I have let some things stay unwell. But, but if I can just do the first thing he said and as he began to get up he started he would have never known he was strong if he never tried to get up some of you are saying God do it make me make me better make me stronger make me wiser he said you'll never know it until you get up you'll never know it until you come out of that you'll never know it until you stop calling them you'll never know it until you break out of that relationship you'll never know it until you step out on faith you'll never know it until you move into that business you'll never know how strong you really are until you get up yes every 
reason not to listen to Jesus. Jesus is a new voice. Some of you, your temptation is going to be, but I don't, even, I don't even know Jesus like that. I didn't respond. For some of us, it's like, but, but these instructions are different than what the people gave me. I know. I know, but, but, but this guy said it was time to do a new thing. And when he responds to Jesus' instructions, he finds his way back to strength. I just, I just want to invite you to respond. And then here's the last thing. You ready for this? You ready for this? And then as you respond, oh, this is going to make some of y'all mad. You ready? You have to release your old cycle. You know what's crazy? Do you want to be well is the start of discipleship. Do you want to stay well is the heart of discipleship. Okay, Bernie, you, you made that up in the text. You just, you preachers just be saying stuff. No, 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 no. <laughs> Look at what the text says. He's already been made well. He's walking. He's talking to people. He's carrying his mat. He's better. And then John 5 and 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. He said to him, say, see, you are well. You are better. You are stronger. You are wiser. But stop sinning. That was going to be the quiet part, I knew. Or what if something worse happens? Then it's important to understand how they would have understood the word sin in this day and age. We talked about this in Bible study. I'm going to say this quickly. That the word sin comes from the word kata. The word kata means failure to meet the goal. And so we see sin in Scripture is not just a testament of moral clauses. It's saying, where in your life are you failing to meet the goal that God has set before you? I'm not preaching to y'all, I'm preaching to us. In all of our lives, in every season, God can be moving us to say, hey, it's time to change the cycle. That you're better, but don't repeat the pattern. Watch this. Seeing our sins is one of the best ways to strengthen our spiritual maturity. And most of us only want to see our strength. We don't want to see our sins. If your prayer life never reveals sin, I worry that it's actually performance. If your prayer life never reveals sin, if in your prayer time with God, he never shows you that you missed the mark. He never shows you that you could have been a better husband. He never shows you could have been a better wife. He never shows you you could have been a better parent. He never shows you you could have been a better friend. He never shows you that your work ethic is off and how dare you ask me for a promotion when you show up late. He, he, never, he never shows you that you want more from me but you don't read your word. That you want more from me but you don't worship. You, you. He never shows you any way. Stop sinning. Because what I don't want for you is to be in this cycle. This cycle of even coming to church and saying, why doesn't this work? Could it be? I want you to see something. Throw that, throw that picture up on the screen. I'm closing here. I've come to find that most people don't want to stay in cycles. <laughs> most people don't stay in cycles because of results. We stay in them because of routine. Look what happens. We, we get convicted. That's what happens today. We're like, okay, something has to change. I got to do better. I want to be well. Want to be well. So conviction leads us to contemplation. The word contemplation literally means careful thought of a thing. So you start saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to contemplate my rhythms at home. I'm going to contemplate my habits. I'm going to contemplate my attitude. I'm going to, I'm going to consider how I can be better. All right. Hear me, hear my heart. And the enemy don't care about neither one of those. 
This is why we end up in cycles. Not because of the results, because some of us have lived long enough to know that the relationships we've been in keep producing the same results. You keep dating the same type of people. The, 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 the success of the job still hasn't produced peace. So money didn't fix it. You had friends, you left those friends, you got new friends, you didn't like those friends, you left those friends, you didn't have five friendship circles in five months. So, so, so it's not a results thing, it's just what happens? Okay, because in between us contemplating life, the God of heaven wants to connect us. Connect us to him. He wants our conversation with him to grow. He wants our prayer life to grow. He wants our discipline to grow. He wants our relationships to grow. So, so, so what God might do in this day is prompt you to say, hey, if you're going to change your life, you got to step into a new community. That's why we do life groups. That's why we do growth. You, you, you want to grow in your faith? Oh, my God, that's why we do growth track. You got to connect to a growth track class. Oh, my God, that's what you need. Oh, yeah, you need to connect and go down to the altar and just get prayer right after this. And somebody can stand with you and agree. Like, like you, you, you got to step into and connect. But what the enemy wants to do is interrupt this cycle. Because he knows. I don't mind you talking. I don't mind you thinking, but if you ever get connected in a new way, then you will experience the change that conversion brings. Say this lastly, I'm closing. There's this guy here who goes to this church. I won't say his name. And, uh, and we, we work out at the same gym. And so um, I love the fact that, you know, there's some people who work out at my gym and they go to the church, but like, you know, they don't like run up to me and like ask me to like pray over them at the gym. <laughs> like, you do your thing. I would if they asked, right? But, but he like kind of stays over and does his workout. I do my workout. I'm like, cool, what's up, bro? He's like, man, God bless you, pastor. Does his workout. But he's like strong. He's huge. So even if he invited me, I wouldn't want to do his workout with him anyway. <laughs> I don't want to do that stuff. It's way too many weights. Not doing that. <laughs> Way too hard. And then the Lord convicted me. Simple conviction. The Lord was like, hey man, you've been working out for like the last five or six years faithfully, consistently, but you haven't hit some of your goals. Could it be that you're good? Like you work out all the time. You're good. You're healthy. But you could be better. Why don't you really go over there? Is it pride? <laughs> I actually do want to be stronger I actually do want to be slimmer I actually do want to cut down a little bit and I just stopped him one day and just began to ask him questions I mean he divulged so much wisdom and the Lord just wrecked me and said Vernon small sign he said see that's how we work he said you're good well, you can be better and many of us have stopped on our spiritual journey with saying, but I'm good. I'm walking. I'm up. But don't go back to the old cycle. Be better. The word salvation is translated nine times in the original language as wholeness. God doesn't just want you better. He wants you whole. And so if you stand on your feet all across this room today, I believe that the question that Jesus asked is the same question then to now do you want to be well don't stay here if you don't want to you don't gotta stay here you ain't got to stay like this. And for some of you, your transformation is going to happen in a private prayer time. Like the Lord is going to meet you in a tangible way and transform your life. But for some of us, it's going to come out of a community that we're going to find. That you don't need another prophetic word. You just need wisdom. And for some of us, we already know what the Lord is saying. It's just going to be a change in routine. 
But I want you to make up in your mind today that it's time to get well. Because Jesus doesn't want to leave you where you are. So would you close your eyes for these last 30 seconds? I'm going to leave us with prayer. I just want to pray. Father, if you would just begin to open our hearts now in this moment. Open our hearts to receive your love. <laughs> open our hearts to receive your conviction. God, this sermon is not just for those of us who are new to you. Some of us have known your voice for a long time. And yet we've been ignoring some of the sin and systems and cycles of our life that have kept us unwell. It's not always the big stuff. Sometimes it's the small stuff. Sometimes we just haven't been disciplined in our schedule. Sometimes we just haven't been disciplined in our eating. Sometimes we just haven't been disciplined in our reading the Bible. Sometimes we just haven't been disciplined in our prayer life. But I pray that as the spirit, the healthy spirit of conviction arises in our hearts, that we say, I want to be well. I want, I want this marriage to not just be good. I want it to be better. I want my parenting not just to be good. I want it to be better this school year. I, I don't want to just be in my community. I want to be great for my community. I want to be well. Pray, God, that we would also find our connection both to you and to the community that you might have to help us sustain what starts in our hearts today. Now, God, there may be someone in this room who needs to accept you as their Lord and Savior. Hear me loud and clear today. I don't care what you did last year, last night, last month. Right now, the Lord loves you. You are a son. You are a daughter. He cares about you. He is so in love with you. So in love with you. And if you've been feeling like my life is good, but I know that I want to be whole and I can't get there without Jesus being my Lord and my Savior. I want to invite you to receive him as your Lord and Savior today. We're going to say this prayer all across this room and hear me loud and clear. If you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior for the first time or rededicate your life to Christ, say, I want to get back on track. We're going to pray this prayer all together because you're family and you're not alone. And if you're ready to be well in this way, I want you with boldness to declare, Lord, I'm ready. Here's what we say, everybody repeating after me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins and getting up for my freedom. I decide to give you my life. From this day forward, I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching this message here at the Life Church. We pray that it continues to encourage you. We exist to impact culture through the innovative presentation of Christianity through inspiring people to live a better life. And if you would like to partner with us in giving, you can text your dollar amount to 84321 or visit us on our website. Be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, and even go check out our other content as well. And don't forget, join us every Sunday online or in person. We'll see you next time. God bless.